Thank you everybody for joining us once again for the eighth in our series uh, from the Crested Butte Mountain Heritage Museum and Colorado State Historian Dwayne Vandenbush. My name is Nell Burkett. I'm the curator at the Crested Butte Mountain Heritage Museum. Uh, to start out with, we'd like to do a land acknowledgement. The museum recognizes that we are guests here on this land, historically Ute territory. We acknowledge that the Uncompahgre Ute and the Jabawatch Ute were forcibly removed from this area due, due to the Bruneau Treaty. We hope that you'll take time to visit our neighbor, the Ute Museum, located in Montrose, Colorado, with exhibits developed in partnership with the Ute Tribes by History Colorado, our state historic society. While we can never do this history justice, we do include information about Paleo Indians of the Gunnison Valley, the Ute people, the Bruno Treaty, and the Los Pinos Indian Agency in our exhibits. We hope that you'll consider becoming members or making a donation to support this program and all the work that we do at the museum. You can do this by visiting our website at crestbuttemuseum.com. We continue to do walking tours through the end of March, every Saturday at 2 p.m. You can also schedule your own private walking tour at your convenience for three or more. This program is being recorded and will be available at crestbuttemuseum.com and on our YouTube page. If you have any questions about programming, uh, visit crestviewmuseum.com, find us on Facebook or Instagram, or sign up for our newsletter. Uh, as for the YouTube, give us about a week to get our videos up uh, after the event itself. A huge thank you to our lead sponsor, Western Colorado University Alumni Relations, as well as Bluebird Realty and Bill Petros. We'll have time for questions at the end of the talk, as always. Please post them in the chat or in the Q&A. And do we have trivia today, Dwayne? We do. We have trivia today. So at the end, right, we'll uh, get answers to the trivia question in the chat. All right, it's all yours. Thank you, Neil, and thanks everybody for being on board. Uh, first thing I wanna talk about is Flauschenk, which is coming up, the end of the ski season. Uh, that The ski area closes on April the 4th and Flauschenk gets underway on March the 31st when I give my usual history of skiing in the Gunnison country. It's seven o'clock, that's Wednesday night. It's gonna be done from the Crested Butte Museum again. So crestedbuttemuseum.com if anybody wants to get on board on Wednesday night. And then I'll have my usual uh, Zoom on seven o'clock on Thursday night and that'll be the ninth one coming up next week. Trivia question for the Crested Butte book will come at the end of the talk today. Want to thank Kevin Sandford and Colorado Investments for purchasing the books to be handed out to the winner. Nell tells me we got 460 people signed up nationwide. Tonight, we're going to talk about Crested Butte. We've been all around it before, skiing, coal, ethnic people, polkas and music, and now we're going to take an in-depth look at the history of Crested Butte. Next week, we're going to talk about Gothic, Schofield, Pittsburgh, Crystal, and the towns at the north end of the valley, some with very exciting histories. And it is about a year right now since the coronavirus hit. And uh, I certainly want to recognize the people that we have lost in our area, especially in Crested Butte, uh, to the coronavirus. Uh, we uh, bless their souls and, and wish the souls very well. Crested Butte, junction to Coal Creek and the Slate River, elevation 8,885 feet, National Historic Site, Elk Mountains in the background, six over 14,000 feet between Crested Butte and Aspen, and towering above the town or near the town is Mount Whetstone, which was actually named by Ferdinand Hayden after Sir Charles Wheatstone, W-H-E-A-T, a great scientist in England and, and Hayden honored him. And somehow through the years that uh, A has been dropped and we refer to it as Mount Whetstone. Other great Lackalif mountains surround Crested Butte, Carbon, Axtell, Crested Butte Mountain, Emmons, and Teocali. Crested Butte was named because of the Crested Buttes of Ferdinand Hayden, who stood on top of Mount Teocali in 1874, looked off in the distance, saw two couple of, a couple of peaks, and he called them the Crested Buttes. Later on, they thought that one more resembled a Gothic cathedral, 
hence the name Gothic Peak. And then they dropped the S from Buttes and Crested Butte Mountain came into play. The father of Crested Butte was Howard Smith of Iowa. He had come to Leadville in 1877, a partner in a smelting company. When he heard of veins and by, by, by bituminous coal had been located by a couple of brothers named Jennings around where Crested Butte is today, he made a quick trip in that year to confirm the find. The following year, he returned with an assayer named Sant Robinson, and he bought up most of the coal land along Coal Creek. His company brought in the first sawmill into the Gunnison country and also built the first smelter called the Pioneer Mill during late 1879 and early 1880. That mill contained 200,000 feet of lumber. It cost $200,000 for the building machinery and freight. And most of the machinery was brought in from Canyon City on sleighs and wagons. It was a stamp mill, but there was never enough ore to succeed and only one silver brick was made. The mill was sold in 1892 for $2,500. In 1878, as Smith and Robinson worked on their property, one man came to Gunnison on horseback for mail and supplies from Kelly's store there once a month. Alonzo Hartman recalled, quote, there were no roads any place out of Gunnison. Howard Smith took the first wagon to where Crested Butte now stands, and he certainly had no pleasure trip getting there. On his first trip, he located in what today is known as the Smith Anthracite coal mine and other properties near Crested Butte. Everybody went out in the fall and came back in the spring of 1879 to stay. The first coke in the county was made by Professor William Curtis and Robinson in a small pit using pine wood as fuel in 1878. In 1878, according to a later newspaper, Mr. Smith purchased the coal claims, chose the smelter site, founded the town, and named it after the mountain peak that overlooks the Slate River Valley and the town site. There's the Great Elk Mountain House on Elk Avenue, later on Danita's. In the early days of Crested Butte, newspapers said, Little attention was given the coal mining industry as metal mining was the leading pursuit and the main industry. Instead, Crested Butte became known as the gateway to the Elk Mountains. It became the great supply town, smelter town, and eventually the railroad town to supply all the silver camps opening up in the North Country, Irwin, Gothic, Pittsburgh, Elkton, Crystal, Schofield, and other smaller camps, all with great dreams. By late 1879, Jan Vandermeer, a reporter for the New York Times, visited and said that the town of Crested Butte had been laid out with a smelter, coal works, sawmill, boarding house, store, one mining engineer's office, and one saloon. The saloon was described by Frank England, one of the 45 men employed by Smith in 1879, and he said the following, three pine trees stood where the freight wagons unloaded near Coal Creek. One of these was felled and split to make a bar, and the men pulled a barrel of whiskey off the wagon and all hunted cans to drink out of. The drink sold at 25 cents each. By late 1879, Several thousand miners had now come into the Elk Mountains searching for gold and silver. And Crested Butte now changed from a way station for miners en route to the north and the west, and now a major supply point for the entire North Country. Helen Hunt Jackson, who had written a great book called Century of Dishonor about the poor treatment of the, American, the Native Americans in the US declared, quote, Every road leading out of Crested Butte comes out before long in a mining camp. It is a natural center for supplies, and in that one fact has an excellent reason for being. All roads led to Crested Butte. In July of, of 1880, Howard Smith incorporated Crested Butte as a town. The future of the town got brighter in early 1880 when it was found that coal exposed along Coal Creek 
made high quality coke. With high quality coke available for the recently started Colorado Coal and Iron Company, later on the Colorado Fuel and Iron Company, Crested Butte Future was made. Howard Smith sold his coal mine and 320 acres of coal land to the Colorado Coal and Iron Company in 1881. And they immediately opened the Jokerville mine just west of town. And there you can see the Jokerville after the big explosion we'll talk about later in 1884. One year later, the Jokerville shipped out 22 cars of coal a day, including four cars of coke. However, miners said that the new bituminous mine contained much gas. Howard Smith kept his hand in coal by locating an anthracite mine four miles north of Crested Butte along the Slate River called Smith Hill. Down below was anthracite, a big coal breaker, the biggest anthracite breaker west of Connellsville, Pennsylvania. In August of 1880, Crested Butte had 400 residents with 1,000 within three miles. It then had 50 business houses, dwellings and tents, a smelter, three sawmills, and a fine hotel called the Forest Queen. Transportation was tough with heavy snow, cold weather, tough terrain, and isolation. The Pioneer Toll Road joined Crested Butte with Irwin in July of 1880. Today, part of that is a mountain bike trail. The same summer, a rough road was built between Gunnison and Crested Butte, which allowed Barlow and Sanderson stages in with a halfway house around Jack's cabin. By late 1881, the Crested Butte Gothic and Ashcroft Road was built to Gothic, eight miles away. They get a good look at Rosich's saloon, and that today is the public house. Across the Elk Mountains to the north, Aspen and Ashcroft with great silver mines were desperate to get their ore to a railroad head, and Crested Butte had the Rio Grande, which arrived on November 21, 1881. The most direct way to get to Aspen was over East Maroon Pass at 11,800 feet, or Pearl Pass at 12,700 feet. Both were very difficult because of elevation, heavy snow, and very, very difficult terrain. The Pearl Pass Road ran up Brush Creek over Pearl Pass at 12,705 feet and down Castle Creek into Ashcroft in September of 82. And there you get the remains of the big fire in 1893 in Crested Butte. And the next photograph will show a gaping hole in the city hall because where they tried to blow up a couple of buildings to keep the fire from spreading but they used too much dynamite and they forgot in some of the buildings that they blew up, the two that they blew up, that there was dynamite in the buildings. And the ensuing blast took out four more buildings than they thought of doing, broke every window in town and broke that gaping hole, blew the gaping hole into the fire hall. Pearl Pass, was originally laid out by the Denver and Rio Grande Railroad. The distance was 24 miles, 16 up Brush Creek, and then eight miles down into Ashcroft. Pitkin County built its road to the top of the pass in 1882, but Gunnison County dallied. One traveler remarked that the road was so bad, and I'm quoting now, that it requires a good team to draw an empty wagon over it. The last eight miles of the road on the Brush Creek side will require much work as builders disregarded the route of the engineers and ran over hills and boulders, making it impassable for teams. By 1885, only a jack trail existed over Pearl Pass. The danger of the pass was shown by the following in 1885, and this came out of the newspaper. The remains of A.C. Adair, the Crested Butte and Aspen mail carrier who lost his life by a snowslide on Pearl Pass near Ashcroft will be buried in Aspen. There are the Coke ovens with the Rio Grande Railroad right in front and back. 
Another possible road to Aspen from Crested Butte suggests it was over Taylor Canyon, through Taylor Park, over Taylor Pass, and down Express Creek into Ashcroft and Aspen. The terrain, however, was terrible and it was never built. In 1883, a road was built over East Maroon Pass. It went up Copper Creek out of Gothic and then down East Maroon Creek into Aspen. It was a toll road and a man named Lesher of Gothic built a dinner station at Copper Lake, complete with stables for freight teams. It took two days from Crested Butte to Aspen with Teamsters staying at a boarding house at Copper Lake. The Rio Grande considered a railroad over East Maroon Pass. Slaves were taken over the pass in winter. Without a railroad and with wagon roads closed much of the time by weather, Jack or Burrow trails with 500 to 1,000 Rocky Mountain Canaries, as they were called, made their way over East Maroon Pass to the railhead at Crested Butte with ore in the early days, and then brought supplies back on the return trip. Crested Butte grew rapidly in the early days and got its first newspaper in October of 1881, the Crested Butte Republican. Johnny e. Phillips moved his Elk Mountain pilot from Irwin in 1884 on a sleigh to Crested Butte as Irwin went downhill and Phillips stayed until 1893. In 1900, Sylvia Smith put out the Crested Butte Weekly Citizen. She was 35, unmarried, six feet tall, championed women's rights, and was a foe of corporations. She had worked in Lake City before and then taught school in Jack's cabin. She criticized the Rio Grande, the Colorado Fuel and Iron Company, and the Colorado Supply Company, previously sacred cows in Crested Butte. She was accused by the pilot of being an anarchist, pressure by the CFNI in Rio Grande, and a lack of advertising for Sylvia Smith out in 1907. From there, she went to Marble, bought the Marble City Times, and went into the pages of history as she fought the Colorado Yule Marble Company and became a celebrity. With the arrival of the Rio Grande Railroad in November of 1881, Investors began to flock in to Crested Butte. Coal and silver brought them in. Horace Tabor of Leadville started the bank of Crested Butte in August of 81. The Forest Queen, Crested Butte House, and Mrs. John Songer's boarding house were built early to handle the traffic. The top hotel in Crested Butte was the Elk Mountain House, which opened in December of 81. It was built by the town company was three stories high, 34 by 100 feet, and took a year and a half to build. It was Crested Butte's answer to the famous La Vida Hotel in Gunnison. By the summer of 1882, Crested Butte had 1,000 people, five hotels, one bank, 12 saloons, three livery stables, 12 restaurants, five sawmills, two doctors, and many lawyers. The Crested Butte Water Company came in 1880 and built a reservoir tapping Coal Creek and storing water in a big reservoir on a hill just west of town for use by the townspeople. In 1882, a telephone line was completed between Gunnison and Crested Butte. In December of 83, City Hall was built with the town's fire equipment in the bottom and business meetings upstairs. In 1882, the first church was built, the Union Congregational, which had a bell from the Irwin Church used. In 1894, the Catholic Hall St. Patrick's was built. A first school was built in 1881 on Big Mine Hill above the Coke ovens. But by 1883, a two-story stone school was built and stands today. By the mid-1880s, Crested Butte's population reached a peak of 1,500. In 1893, the silver panic came. Silver plummeted to 58 cents an ounce, and Crested Butte's days as a silver mining area and gateway to the Elk Mountains were gone. 
The early population of Crested Butte was Anglo-Saxon, Cousin Jacks, best miners in the world from England, Ireland, Scotland, and Wales with names like Murray and McNeil, Gardner, Sanderson, McAllister, Ross, Flynn, and McCluskey. After 1895, Crested Butte got much of its population from Southeastern Europe, Italy, the Austro-Hungarian Empire, Yugoslavia, Czechoslovakia, Croatia, and Serbia. They were much different than the Northwest Europeans. They were Catholic. Their culture was different. They were farming people, and they didn't speak the English language. Many problems came early with fights and different celebrations and lodges until gradual assimilation took over. The names were strange. Sporsich, Mahelic, Saya, Panyan, Kapushin, Krizmanich, and Sedmak. Crested Butte was not an appealing place in the 1880s. Most of the trees had been cut for mine props and ties and cabins. Streams were polluted by mine tailings and sawdust and a black mist of pollution from the mines hung over the town. Ernest Ingersoll, a writer who came through the town in 1884 declared, and I quote, there are mines here, but the key to the town is found in the coal banks. And at night when the blaze of the coke oven sends a ruddy glare upon the overhanging woodlands in the snug town, one can appreciate the far seeing expectations leading the people to say that they live in the Pittsburgh of the West. The top mine in the early 1880s was the Jokerville, which had always been considered dangerous because of seeping methane gas, a gas that you can't smell. The Jokerville employed 120 men, and at 7.30 in the morning on January the 24th, 1884, just after the second shift had finished, an explosion rocked the town destroyed a hundred feet of the tipple leading into the mine and smashed the fan which gave ventilation and air inside. Several outside buildings were on fire. No rescue work had come until the fire and gas accumulation was out. Johnny Cashin led 10 men out from 1800 feet inside the mine, creating false hope for the people who had gathered outside. However, 17 other miners uninjured got to within 200 feet of the entrance and then ran out of air. By February 2nd, 1884, 61 bodies, all cousin Jacks, were brought out of the mine and 46 were buried in a mass grave at the Crested Butte Cemetery. Seeping methane gas caused that explosion with the Colorado Coal and Iron Company very negligent. The mine foreman, John Gibson, had only been in the mine six times in a year because he thought it was very dangerous. Geologist Arthur Lakes from Colorado Mines said later, a ticking sound is heard always from the escape of gases in the coal. The coal of this mine contains the greatest amount of dangerous gas in the state. The Jokerville never reopened and a monument and a memorial was put in at the cemetery many years later in 2017, honoring the miners who died. The top coal mine in Crested Butte history was the CF&I Big Mine, which opened in 1894. It was located just south of town under Gibson Ridge and Baxter Basin. By 1902, it employed 400 men, produced 1,000 tons of coal a day, and had six miles of track and 70 mules in the mine. It was the third largest mine in Colorado and had the top quality coal. Between 1894 and 1910, the big mine produced 2 million tons of coal and 500,000 tons of coke. Men were paid $4 a day. In 1952, after 58, years of continuous production, the CF&I big mine shut down because of the changeover to oil and gas and electricity and the expense of transportation. And there you can see they're building the tipple of the big mine in 1894. 
there were 154 coke ovens in Crested Butte. And there you can see the tipple, the mine, the 156 steps which went up onto the bench, the coke ovens, and the Denver Rio Grande Railroad. And that was taken about 1898. The coke ovens were located on the bench at the south end of town. They were made of fire brick and encased with stone. The ovens were connected by a large track which ran next to the oven openings, allowing the coal to be drawn to them by mule. The ovens were heated red hot before the coal went in. The coal was baked for 48 hours, driving out some of the carbon dioxide, and then cooled, watered out, and drawn. The coke was then loaded by fork onto waiting railroad cars next to the ovens and sent to the CFNI steel mills in Pueblo. And as I mentioned in an earlier episode, the coke from Crested Butte, the lime from the limestone quarry on the east side of Monarch Pass, the molten iron from Trinidad, all came together in a blast furnace created by Henry Besmer of England. And that's how you converted iron into steel. So Crested Butte absolutely indispensable in the industrial revolution of the US. Many other coal mines existed around Crested Butte. Smith Hill, four miles up the slate with the great anthracite coal breaker down below. The Buckley, the Pueblo and the Robinson just east of town. And you can see the remains on the, uh, on the west side of Highway 135 as you come in. The Jokerville obviously and the CFNI big mine. The Pershing and the Peanut up the lower loop. And then the Great Floresta, 11 miles to the west of Crested Butte. Floresta was originally called Ruby Anthracite began in 1887, but the name soon changed for the trees, Spanish for forest. It grew rapidly after the Rio Grande arrived in 1893, had a post office, school, boarding house, but 25 to 30 feet of snow fell every year, causing the railroad only being able to drive through for about six months out of the year. Floresta got the top coal breaker west of Connellsville, Pennsylvania in 1898. Built for $98,000, 114 feet high, 75 feet wide, 124 feet long, five levels, breaking coal into different sizes. Floresta shut down in 1918 as a result of weather conditions, the end of World War I, and oil and gas coming in. All the coal miners of Crested Butte and the surrounding area were exploited by the Colorado Fuel and Iron Company and the other companies that hired them. The companies took advantage of the foreign language and the need for a job. Workers lived in company housing, were paid off in scrip, shopped at the company store, and if one got killed, the coroner's report always said, quote, no blame was attached to the company. A mule was mo worth much more than a man. A mule cost $70. The miners were also told how to vote. Here's a quote from one of the newspapers. J.K. Robinson, superintendent of the big mine, issued orders that every miner shall vote for Stevens and Daly or be crushed. He has trusted lieutenants on the ground to deal out the tickets and the orders to the men. The song 16 Tons by Tennessee Ernie Ford a number of years ago applied to the men who work there. 16 tons and what do you get? Another day older and deeper in debt. St. Peter, don't you take me because I can't go. I owe my toll to the company store. Strikes came in Crested Butte and around the nation because of the brutal conditions. 1891, 1913-14, and 1927. But they were never successful because coal was fading as a fuel and because the law always favored management. Fires were very damaging to Crested Butte. They were common in mining camps because Lack of fire protection, especially in the winter. 
buildings were built out of wood and tinder dry. The buildings were very close together. And in the buildings, there were many explosives, kerosene, and dynamite. In 1890, a fire took out 15 businesses at a cost of $50,000. The 1893 fire cost $40,000 in damage. And when they dynamited the two buildings to stop the spread of the flames, they took out, as I said, four more than they wanted, broke every window in town, and drove a gaping hole through the fire hall. A 1901 fire destroyed some of downtown and cost $50,000. There is the Crested Butte Town Band, 1900. I love that band because the guy on the left with the sunglasses, I think resembles John Belushi and Blues Brothers. And it's a great band, everybody playing instruments at that time. Crested Butte remained prosperous up to the close of the big mine in 1952, but there always were problems. The foreigners of Crested Butte were always accused of supporting the Austrians and the Germans in World War I. Strikes as gas and oil began to replace coal. Stills, which were uncovered during Prohibition. The stills started NASCAR. The good old boys who were driving fast cars with lights out on dirt roads at 80 miles an hour, led by a revenue runner named Junior Johnson. Later on, the good old boys began NASCAR. Mine accidents killed many. Exploitation of the miners by railroad and mining companies. Hard feelings with Gunnison, as Crested Butte was always looked down upon as lower class people, and many deaths from the elements and epidemics. In 1925, Ben Snyder, cashier in the Bank of Crested Butte, said that the town had a population of 1,200 and was the only real anthracite town in the West. There's a photo of Armistice Day in November, November 11, 1919, celebrating one year after World War I. The coal of Crested Butte was shipped as far west as California and Alaska, as far southwest as Texas, and as far northeast as Minnesota. The Elk Mountain House and CFNI Hotel were the two big hotels in town. The CFNI later on became the Elk Mountain Lodge. Baseball was a sport that Crested Butte played very well, and the games against Gunnison were hotly contested with much gambling and much drinking and fighting too. In 1886, Gunnison beat Crested Butte in a town in, in, in Crested Butte with the game called after seven innings because of bad treatment of the umpire and Crested Butte team by the Crested Butte fans. The Crested Butte newspaper declared, quote, the manner of receiving guests by the people of Crested Butte when they arrive from Gunnison is about the same as that practiced by the Visigals and the Vandals in the Dark Ages. The score of the game was 24-18 Gunnison in a game interrupted by rain, snow, and dogfights on the field. There is a coffin with Tuffy McHugh in 1927 being taken to a blockhouse where it would be stored and then buried when the ground thawed in the spring of the year. Dr. Hubert Smith, a doctor and lawyer from Texas, came to Crested Butte in the early 1950s and bought up property and homes and used them for his summer institutes for doctors and lawyers. And that brought a lot of publicity to the town. There's a great shot of the road into Crested Butte around the turn of the century the railroad running off to the right. And that road wasn't open very often, especially in the winter and the spring of the year. The big mine closed in 1952. The railroad tracks went out in 1955 and Crested Butte became near ghost town, losing most of its population with no seeming way of making a living. Population fell to 300. Houses sold for $500. Lots for 50 bucks. 
The Keystone Mine west of town was started by the American Smelting and Refining Company in the 1950s to hopefully replace the CFNI big mine. They built an $800,000 mill. It turned out lead, zinc, copper, and silver, but it never really paid its way and closed in the late 1960s. And then came Dick Eflin and Fred Rice, two Kansas fraternity brothers who bought the Malensic Ranch, Matt and Rudy Malensic's ranch at the base of the mountain and started the Crested Butte ski area with a rope tow and a J bar in 1961. The gondola came in 1962, and there's Father Leo McKenna blessing the gondola, the Italian tradition, whereupon the gondola broke down for the rest of the day, and Father McKenna slipped in the parking lot and fractured a kneecap. The banks took over the ski area by the mid-1960s with a guy named Gus Larkin running it for them. And then Bo Calloway and Ralph Walton bought it in 1970 and ran it until 2004, when they sold to the Muller family of Vermont. They had owned Sunapi and Okimo. And then they held on to it until 2019, when they sold it to Vale Associates. Today, in Crested Butte, 6,000 people live at the north end of the valley. Crested Butte is a town of 1,600. The Crested Butte School is ranked one of the best in the nation. 400,000 skier days every year at the ski area. The Grand Traverse, the great music festivals, 4th of July, which draws 10 to 15,000 people into town. One of the best mountain biking areas in the world. Great arts and crafts festivals. The wildflower capital of Colorado. Vinatok, Flushing, the great scenery, and the Elk Mountains, Crested Butte, not so much a place as a state of mind. And that's it about one of the great towns of the American West and absolutely my favorite town in Colorado. And now we will give the trivia question and Nell is gonna tell you how to answer. All right, so first person to post in the chat the answer to Dwayne's question will win the trivia prize. Now, because of the way uh, the internet works in different uh, computers responding at different times, what who ends up winning on our side of the computer may be different than what you see on your end. So it's whoever we see first on our end in the chat, not the Q&A, the chat. The Crested Bid book is on the line, and here is the question, first come, first serve. I want the name of the brothers whose ranch was bought and became the base of the Crested Bid ski area. Ooh. First come, first serve. Kara Guerreri with Malensic. Rich and Phyllis Guerreri got it. The Malensic brothers, Matt and Rudy, they will get the book. Good job, Richard and Phyllis. Now, we'll go to the Q&A. Anybody who wants to ask questions, go ahead. We got the first one. Who had the first phone line in 1882? I have no idea except that it ran from Crested Butte to Gunnison. Any other questions, uh, hit nail and I'll try to answer. Great to have everybody on board. Man, you covered the history so well tonight. It's uh, apparently everybody got their answers. How long did they mine coal? Uh, Annie Klassen asked, how long did they mine coal? And uh, Annie, the uh, big mine operated from 1894 to 1952, and that was pretty much it. Uh, the Bruno Treaty mentioned by Nell, that was 1873 and the Ute Indians were moved out of the San Juan. They had to give up the tops of the mountains and then they hoped to get it later on. But that was the thing that moved them out and they were later on moved to Kelowna on the uh, Uncompagre River, 12 miles south of Montrose, moved from the Los Pinos Indian Agency. Cam Smith. 
Why didn't the Roaring Fork Valley get a railroad? Uh, the major answer to that question is, it was very, very difficult terrain. You have to gonna go over Fremont Pass. You're gonna have to come over Loveland Pass. Too difficult to get in. Uh, Natasha asks, are there any remains of the Jokerville mine still present today? None, although you can kind of see where it was just west of town. But it closed up, reopened briefly, then was closed up in 1886, far too dangerous. When was the road to Gunnison finally paved? You know, I've asked the question of locals and they don't quite remember, but I can tell you that it was after World War II and probably not until the early 1950s. Even the Colorado uh, Department of Transportation doesn't know. We've contacted them. Wow. Uh, how were the fans in the Jokerville mine powered? Were is it by electricity or something else? No, the, 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 there was no power in the Jokerville mine. Everything was dug by hand. So, but the fans, the fans that brought in the fresh air. Oh, the, those... the fans, yeah, they were powered by a generator outside of the mine. Um, how did miners find where silver or other precious metals were located in order to start a mine? Well, they followed what was known as the Colorado Mineral Belt which ran from Caribou up around Netherland and Boulder in the north all the way to Durango. And they chipped away with their hammer and they always look for exposed veins on top of the ground. And usually in silver mining, silver is found with a little iron above the ground. And there's an old saying, a load will never cut rich and fat unless it wears an iron hat. So they knew the foundations. These guys are very smart. Can you share more information about minor labor unrest in the early 1900s? Yeah, you know, there was always labor unrest with the United Mine Workers primarily for good reason. I mean, mining was very dangerous. These guys weren't paid very much and they were spit out anytime they died. No big deal, just bring another guy in. The big strike came in 1913 and 14, United Mine Workers, John Mitchell, 140,000 coal miners went out on strike nationwide. But there were periodic strikes that went on all the time. But the government never really protected the miners. The newspapers usually didn't defend them. They're kind of out there on their own and the union was what they had. And believe me, the union was the best thing that ever happened to the miners in the early days. Uh, are there any mines still operating? No coal mines operating in the Gunnison country today. What was the purpose of the Denver, South Park and Pacific Railroad and what time frame did it exist? Denver, South Park and Pacific Railroad built by John Evans, ex-governor Colorado, uh, built in stages from 1873 to 1882, uh, came from Denver through Turkey Creek Canyon, Kenosha Pass, South Park, uh, down up the Chalk Creek, through the Alpine Tunnel, down into Parlin and Pitkin, into Gunnison, September of 82, and then went 15 miles up Ohio Creek, heading for the booming town of Irwin. But the boom ended, and it never made it. So the major purpose was to tap out what appeared to be one of the great silver and gold areas in the nation, the Gunnison country, but it didn't turn out that way. Was Gunnison a territorial capital of Colorado? No, Gunnison was like a lot of other boom towns that opened up. They dreamed of becoming the capital of Colorado, but obviously that never came close to happening. When the boom ended, all talk ended. When and how many miners' houses were moved to Gunnison? You know, I don't know. Uh, a number of them were, and I don't quite know the number. Uh, people like Rich and Phyllis Guerrero or Lee Spann might be able to help me out on that. I will try to find out and have the answer next week. Are there still silver mines around Crested Butte today? 
Uh, no, no silver mines, uh, no gold mines, although I know a few people who engage in a little placer mining every year. Um, the only gold mine that was operating was Gold Links up uh, Gold Creek near Ohio City. But pretty much the gold and silver mines are long gone. What is the oldest building still standing in Crested Butte? Well, you know, I'd have to uh, give you about two or three. The uh, number, uh, you know, Forest Queen, uh, Union Congregational Church, uh, those probably would be, I would think, the two oldest. Uh, would you speak about the disaster in the big mine that occurred around 1941? Well, there was no disaster. A number of people got killed in the big mine in 1941, but you know, it was kind of a common occurrence that you would have men killed in the mines. I always like to say that uh, going through the newspapers, you know, four or five guys got killed in the mines every year. And uh, the big mine, I think, had two or three that were killed in the 41 uh, disaster. But I don't have any specific notes on that. So I'm kind of ignorant about what exactly happened. Well, this might be kind of part two to that question. Other than the Jokerville, were there other major losses of life in the mines? Never any major losses of life, certainly not like 61, which is a worst mining disaster in Colorado up to that time and still the third worst today. But people got killed because of rock falls. People got killed by getting kicked by a mule. People get, got killed by ore cars hitting them. So like I've said, there probably were four to five people every year killed in the mines. Can you remind us of the origin of the word Tiakali? Yeah, you know, Tiakali is a, an Indian term uh, that was used for Tiakali Creek and it roughly means mountain stream. Um, was black lung disease widespread among Crested Butte miners? Yes, it was a lot, but, but these guys still lived on, you know, until their 70s and 80s. And the major reason was that they weren't real old when the CFNI big mine shut down. Mm -hmm. But black lung was uh, persistent in every coal mine. Now, Nell, you had Kate Schmidt on. I want to make sure that she tells you that she got her book. <laughs> okay. Any other questions? Uh, what year did the population of Irwin start to dissipate? You know, the, the last great year of Irwin was 1882. By 1884, people were leaving. That's when Johnny e. Phillips left with the Elk Mountain Pilot. So I say 82 was the last great year. And it closed because James B. Grant, the great mining man of Leadville, referred to knife blade seams. So the seams of silver were just very thin. Uh, how did the Jokerville get its name? You know, I've uh, tried to find that out and I'm still working on it. I have no idea, but I'm working on it. What a history's mysteries, yeah. That's right. Uh, is there a road from Crested Butte to Ashcroft today? Well, yeah, it's Pearl Pass. Uh, once you go over Pearl Pass, you drop right down into Ashcroft uh, and then from Ashcroft, about 11 miles into Crested Butte. But obviously it's a very rough road and if you take a vehicle over, you better take it in for repairs after going over the road. Um, what? Uh, what year was Elk Avenue paved? Elk Avenue was paved, I think, when I've asked this question, right around 1974. Um, the old timers would make sure to say that that was when it was paved again, because they've, they've made sure <laughs> to tell me it was paved before 1974. Okay. But there were big giant potholes and it was a pretty much a wreck at that point. I certainly yield to them. Yeah. Uh, uh, what was mined at Peanut Mine in addition to coal? Uh, well, it was semi-anthracite. Later on, Josiah Sr. owned it. 
And then after that, they tried to uh, get a little silver out of it, but that never really worked. Let's see. Uh, we've answered this question next. Uh, when and how many miners' cottages were moved to Gunnison? Did we already ask that one? Yeah, we did. Huh. And I say, I don't know, but I'm going to find out. Yeah. Uh, was the original road to Gothic along the East River via Brush Creek? Yes, it was. That's where the early uh, route was for mail carriers. So it was not on the same road that you have today. It just followed the geography in the East River. Um, where were the forest fires? I read Coal Creek burned in the 1800s. There were many forest fires that occurred. Usually the Ute Indians set a few when they left, they were very angry at having to leave, but then they were primarily caused by electricity, by, uh, you know, lightning. And uh, never, never a real major one. They were allowed to burn themselves out because nobody really lived in the areas where they were. But I remember one up in the West Elk Wilderness area, uh, one along Coal Creek, uh, you know, around Irwin, uh, but none that was ever a real severe threat to people living in the region. All right, the last question that I see uh, is from Mark Ellis. What year did Crested Butte have the most snow? <laughs> well, you know, I, I since I've been here, I would say the winter of 64, 65 and the winter of 2007 and 8. When I went over to give a talk for Monarch on December 6, 2007, there was grass on the slopes of the Monarch ski area. Went by about 4.30. At 9 o'clock, the talk was over and Rich Moorhead, the mountain manager, said, Dwayne, you're going to have to go back over Poncha Pass and Cochito Pass. Monarch is closed. They got 528 inches that year, and Crested Butte got 428. And it would be hard to beat that. Uh, got another question in, and uh, Carol Johnson asks, could you speak about the Utes forced remo removal, please? Well, the Ute Indians were moved from the Los Pinos Reservation in 1875 because mining strikes had come in the San Juan. And it looked like the Gunnison country was going to open up as another great mining area. Nearby Lake City had already opened. So, as usual, you can't have Indians living on land that the white man wants to use for ranching, farming, or mining. Who the hell they think they were? So they were moved out to Kelowna. And the usual thing that happened. And uh, for Carol, we did do a little bit of this history in another se session. I think it was like session two or three, right? You got in more into that uh, Puebloan history as well as you history. Uh, years ago, there would be a there would be horse races down the street on the south side, as well as a capture the pig during the Fourth of July event. What year was that? I don't remember that. It must have been before I came here. Yeah. That sounds fun, though. They also yeah, had it some, does. Uh, slipper kicking. That was a good one. Um. Let's see, we have a few comments coming in. Uh, I moved to Crested Butte in 62. Elk Avenue was asphalt paved by then, but there were no sidewalks and the pavement was really bad. Major improvements in 74, including new pavement and relocation of underground utilities. Thank you very much for that. I appreciate it. Yeah, thanks, Keith. Uh, let's see, Kerry Guerrero notes, it sounds like ranching never really figured in Crested Butte economics. Is that true? Care ranching always figured in Crested Butte economics because in the early days when the, mine, when the mining boom came and thousands of people were at the north end of the valley, most of the great ranches started because they made a lot of money by supplying beef to the mining camps. And then, as you know better than I, Nikolai, Guerreri, Malensic, uh, one great ranch after another, 
And uh, a lot of fresh beef was supplied to Crested Butte very early. And then of course the railroad came in and you were able to bring more stuff in. But one of the talks I'm gonna give uh, in this series is sustainability in the Gunnison country. And I think a lot of people are gonna be shocked by how much the Gunnison country was able to produce meat and other things, farming produce. Uh, and typically you do do a, a talk on that. So that's great. Yes, um, it's coming up. Yeah. Can you speak about the visit by Butch Cassidy to Crested Butte? <laughs> yeah, well, this is all a rumor, but I think it's true. Butch and Sundance and their gang came through on their way to the hole in the wall gang at, in a hole in the wall place in Northwestern Colorado and then up into Wyoming. They stopped at Cochevers for a beer they were required to hang their gun belt up. Uh, they're having a beer. And one of the gang outside yelled, here they come. And Butch and Sundance ran out, but Butch forgot his gun, which is still owned by the Cochever family. And they made their way just ahead of the posse. Uh, now, before we even got started, you were talking about events coming up and things going on. And so I just got a question about uh, what what is it that starts tomorrow? Uh, not nothing that I know starts tomorrow. Are we we talked about Flauschink at the beginning though, right? Yeah, Flauschink, uh, March thirty one. I give my show on uh, the skiing history of the Gunnison Country through the Crested Butte Museum, and Nell very graciously agreeing to work. And then uh, on April the second is gonna be, uh, uh, that's on Friday, and right by Cochevers at the west end of Elk Avenue, Lorenzo is gonna play the accordion, there's gonna be some polka dancing, and the king and queen are gonna be crowned from five to seven. Everybody's gotta be virtual this year. Parade the next day. Now I will note, Flausch Inc. is not a museum event. Flausch Inc. is its own entity and they will be the ones that um, post in the newspaper. That's where you're gonna find information. They don't have an official website. I think they have a, a Facebook page, but Flausch Inc. is our oldest uh, weird costumed fun time tradition. Um, so they, they kind of operate a little differently than uh, a lot of us. So you won't find them online. Yeah, Kim uh, Kohler says, how is it spelled? F-L-A-U-S-C-H-I-N-K. Flushing out the old year, bringing in the new. Thank you, Kim. Uh, another question. What do you know about Joe Block, butcher who built the house at 412 Elk Avenue in 1880? Wow, so 1880 may be one of the oldest. All I know is that he had that butcher shop and I've got a picture of him standing with some friends on a boardwalk right next to his butcher shop. Uh, Kim asks, is Flauschenk tied to any cultural history or truly a CB original? No, it's truly a CB original started by George Sibley, Art Norris, and uh, Chuck Wirtz in a bar to designate the end of the ski season in 1969. Uh, when were you king of Flauschenk? 2002. I think I'm the only guy in Gunnison ever become the king of Flauschenk in Crested Butte. Hey. And it was a great honor and still is. All right. All right, so we're going to wrap it up. Thank you, everybody, for your great, great questions. Thank you to our sponsors, uh, Western Colorado University Alumni Relations, as well as Bud Bush over Bluebird Realty and Bill Petros. Thank you so much for supporting us. And of course, find out all about Flauschenk in the newspaper. <laughs> and then you can learn everything else at CrestedViewMuseum.com. Thanks, Dwayne. Yeah, thanks, Nell. Thanks, everybody, for being on. I appreciate it. Nell, how many do we have on board tonight? We had over 130 tonight. Oh, that's good. Yep. That's good. Okay, Nell, thanks a million. All right, we'll see you all next week. You bet. Over and out.